Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mr. Dan uh, George. Now I've got to figure out how to change my background. There he is. Hey. Can you hear me all right? I sure can. <laughs> okay. Great. Trying to make it a larger, uh, wider screen. <laughs> Harold Locke says, rock and rob and tweet, tweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> are we on? Yeah. Well, they can hear you. Our mics are. Okay. How do I make the screen are... larger? Uh, it's not top. a big deal. Yeah, I can see me. Like I can't see you, Bob. You can't see me. Not yet. I need to do something else here. You, can, you can probably see Kent. No, I see me. Just you, huh? Okay. <laughs> that didn't work very well. Yeah, you turned your video so you're upside down and everything. It's pretty cool. Harold Locke says, I think I'm going to enjoy today's program. <laughs> Jeff Weiss says, let's do some birding. You know, there's a lot. I, I, I was really surprised at this. I don't know why I'm so surprised, but apparently there's a lot of amateur astronomers who are also birders. And uh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, ornithology is the study of birds and yeah. astronomy is the study of the stars and the sky yeah that's right so now i have i think i have i have kent i, I clicked on kent i can also click on scott roberts where do where I, where should i click here i'd say you're just fine i mean you can't okay. you can't see us yet so all right so i guess the point of my comment is bird watching birding is basically study the study of birds and their activities and behaviors and so forth mm -hmm. and it takes it it take it takes a person with general level of intelligence or, or curiosity as to why does a bird only do this or do that or why are they only this you know that kind of thing it's the study of every every better their every part of their behavior i see Well, very good. I think we're all here and we're ready to get started. So I'm going to take us to, uh, I got like a little video. Uh, Dan, it talks a little bit about, uh, um, this This was a video presented by NASA about how they use satellites to uh, help bird migrations and stuff. So we'll go to that. Okay. Right. We took freely available Landsat imagery and we developed this range-wide model that covers a vast spatial extent and a really wide temporal window to develop these fine scale maps of habitat suitability for an endangered species in an environment that's changing all the time. So 
So I'm a research biologist slash project manager for the University of Idaho, and I work on this endangered Ridgeways rail in the southwestern United States. It's a species that needs attention. It is an indicator species of marsh condition throughout the whole Colorado River system. I know they're, they're a marsh bird, they're, they're like the size of a chicken, but they're high up the food chain in these marshes. And so if rails are doing well, it's indicative of a healthy system. So if we can develop products that help us manage marshes for the rails, it's also going to help protect habitats for other species. And we were really focusing on, okay, how do we take effective tools and apply them in space and time to maximize their benefit to the species? So we paired this spatially extensive on-the-ground sampling data with really extensive satellite imagery to develop range-wide habitat suitability models that can inform management actions uh, throughout the range of this species. We needed a product that was accessible, available, covered our area of interest, and our time frame of interest in Landsat really fit that perfectly for us. And we built this tool that is accessible to managers and they can view it and it's updated annually so they'll have up-to-date predictions of habitat suitability throughout the entire range of the species so they can really focus in on the areas that need management, that don't need management, that perhaps need on the ground confirmation. It should be a powerful tool to more effectively and efficiently allocate limited resources to ideally one day get this species fully recovered. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts here with um, Kent Martz and uh, Dan George. Uh, that we uh, we wanted to introduce Dan to you. Um, to uh, uh, he's the leader. He's our uh, um, he's the guy that's going to lead us through our programs called On the Wing, which is a show about birding, but I guess all things that will fly in nature and. Uh, um, Dan has a passion for uh, birding that goes back a long time. Uh, I, I met Dan in the 1990s. Um, I knew that he was a uh, expert in binocular optics, but also I found out that he loved to observe birds. Um, recently, um, a person that has been affiliated with us for a long time, was, his name is Sheldon Faworski. He's been sending us images of uh, birds, which Kent has shared on some of our programs occasionally, just to show how op, you know how sharp uh, some of our optics are. But uh, uh, that's um, that's not really the point of the show. This the point of the show is to uh, to give you uh, a deeper appreciation for. Uh, 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 birds and how to observe them, uh, how to get involved in the community and that type of thing. Dan George uh, has uh, a long time interest in this, but it goes back also to his time at uh, uh, Bosch and Loam. Uh, he was part of uh, the Bosch and Loam, maybe Bushnell Birding Council, is that right? Or was it called the Bosch and Loam Birding Council, Dan? Bosch and Loam Birding Council. Bosch, Bosch and Loam. So I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience. Um, maybe you can give them, uh, I, may, I don't know how, how long you've been interested in, in observing birds. Did it start from childhood or did it start from your activity at work or how did it go? I was a uh, regional sales manager, one of five, uh, for the Bushnell division of Bosch and Loam. And the products that we marketed basically to retail were, were binoculars, telescopes, spotting scopes, mm -hmm. rifle scopes, and anything else with quality optics. And uh, it came a, there came a time where bird watching became a, a budding activity for which we would need binoculars to be able to see the, the birds clearly. And um, I kind of glommed onto it because I was always one to 
to, to help the consumer understand why you would spend $500 for a pair mm. of binoculars versus $50 at a, right. at a Walmart. <laughs> and uh, rather than being just a hippy dippy salesman, I wanted to talk about facts and why high end or qual good quality optics uh, will enhance any activity. Uh -huh. And so I then, um, I then had a reputation inside of the company that, you know, if anybody wants to talk about optics and why a person should spend more than a, more than a few hundred dollars for a pair of binoculars, go talk to Dan, he'll give you the reasons for it. So it evolved to a point where I, I met um, one, of the, one of the guys that helped create the Balshalom Birding Council. And I got to a point where they want to be the, be the, the director because I had sales experience and I also had the, the knowledge of the products. So mm -hmm. that's basically how I got involved in birding. So not to dominate, I'll talk another minute here, is that part of the Baal Birding Council is to bring a group of seven or eight well-known in the industry, in the birding industry, yeah. well-known to tour leaders, authors, lecturers, people that knows literally everything from ornithology all the way to the, to the average field field. Uh, uh, Field yeah. ophthalmologists. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's wrong. Anyway, that's okay. I make a mistakes a few. You, <laughs> you can make them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I ended up doing is that, I mean, I, if you're going to be asking people for their opinions, you need to find a little, uh, found out a little bit about them. So I ended up yeah. um, visiting each of these people to learn what they know about birding and then bring it all together and make sure that the company has products that meet the needs of the the, com the common bird watcher and that's and that was 1986 86 yeah was the year that i got hooked on birding because birding is enhanced if you have good optics yeah so i mean did you feel like you got like sucked into birding i mean i can tell you know uh, you know you approach is maybe from um you know you're you're a professional sales guy um uh but you know, I think that you went like some steps beyond, you know, you just didn't go, okay, I met my quota, I had, I hit my goals, I, whatever, okay. Um, it, it seems to me that you really genuinely, really became fascinated with birds. Actually, it was an absolute privilege in retrospect, that they asked me to, to be the director of the Bouchelon Birding Council, uh -huh. because we would go, we would go to, uh, trade shows or consumer shows out in the field like yeah. at national audubon societies and things like that and i would always be there so i at some point i became almost the face of bashalom birding optics so simply because i had these different hats and right. to this day 30 plus years later i i literally am so grateful and thankful that i have the interest still of, of birds and um, about their behavior, about their habitats. Mm -hmm. And I was moved by that video that you showed about that rail. I mean, I was, I was so concerned at that time about water pollution in a lot of your, uh, oh, yeah. in a lot of your wetland areas. So I, it was all based on, I had a hobby. Yeah. I was with Bausch and Lom and Bushnell. Yeah. But that was just a different hat. Right. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So um, we, you know, we've had a, a nice source, a nice stream of images coming in from Sheldon. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, Kent on, on his own, um, uh, you know, he knows so many people here in the Northwest Arkansas. And we have, damn, we've got all kinds of songbirds and migratory birds coming through here. We're in Northwest Arkansas. We have bald eagles. Uh, you know, um, they they have uh, I think a nesting area here, and people go oh, yeah. specifically travel to Arkansas to go see these bald eagles. Um, so I, you know, when when it gets to that time, you know, we'll we'll cover that. You know, um, but Kent found a local guy uh, here um, and talking to some friends of his. And um, Kent, why don't you give a little introduction to this gentleman? that um, allowed us to share his images today. And I don't hear you, Kent. <laughs> I still don't hear you.
Ken, something's wrong with your audio, dude. <laughs> so, anyways, I'll I'll try to I'll try to help out a little bit. This guy's name is Terry Stanfill. He lives in Northwest Arkansas. Ken told me this guy literally goes out four hours every day and photographs birds. Okay. Um, now, in in this particular, can you see the uh, screen? Okay, um, uh, Dan. Yes, I can. It's a beautiful yeah. picture. Great. Yeah, this is called a a dick sistle. Yeah, uh, with nesting material. So I'll, I'll let I'll let Kent kind of uh, uh, go through the uh, the uh, slides on his PowerPoint um, as we go along here. Um, but uh, um, but now everybody knows in our audience that you know while I'm I'm well versed in in astronomy. Um, you know, uh, I I have a fascination for nature and everything, but I'm not a birder. I would like to be a birder. I would like to be able to uh, listen to a songbird and go, oh, that's a such and such up there, you know, or, um, you know, or to be able to see different species of birds and be able to tell them apart, um, you know, the classification of birds and stuff. And so, uh, Dan, maybe you can help us out. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I we do. can hear you now. <laughs> my, my mouse disappeared. And, oh, and wow. it was It was gone, I <laughs> and so I couldn't click on anything. Okay, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll jump in here. Terry Stanfill um, has lived in Northwest Arkansas for a long time. Uh, he's an yeah. Arkansas resident, and he worked at the uh, Flint Creek Power Plant, which is a, he was a chemist at the Flint Creek Power Plant, which is a coal-fired generation station on the western side of Benton County. And they created an impoundment along Flint Creek, not in Flint Creek, but a tributary. And uh, that lake uh, had some marshland in it and uh, began to draw all sorts of birds, uh, both summer and winter. And Terry uh, was one of the moving forces in creating what's called the Eagle Watch Nature Trail. And you can Google it. Um, and it's 65 acres, have a, has a bunch of trails that go through the woods and water and marsh. And um, Terry spends a lot of time out there uh, in the uh, pavilions and uh, some box blinds, I think, uh, shooting a lot of pictures. And he has not, no special gear. I think he uh, probably is still using a Nikon D7000 and a 300 millimeter lens. And, you know, he, but he makes his own luck like everyone does by, being, by knowing his equipment and being out there in the woods and in the water and snapping pictures everywhere. And so all of these pictures I've got have been taken within the last 30 or so days here in Northwest Arkansas. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so very, you, you, you picked a wide variety of different. Yes. Uh, yeah. No theme okay. here other than just no theme here other than just what, what Terry's been shooting and posting on Facebook and you can find him at Facebook, Terry Stanfill, S T A N F I L L. Um, uh -huh. And uh, he posts pictures nearly every day. Uh, he goes over to the Buffalo River a lot uh, and, and posts a lot of uh, scenic pictures and the elk. He shoots wildflower pictures. Um, he is a uh, swamp milkweed uh, warrior. Uh, he extols the virtues of the swamp milkweed for monarch butterflies. Okay. Um, he uh, gathers, he's identified prairie remnants in Northwest Arkansas and collects seeds and distributes seeds to people who want to plant native prairie wildflowers. Um, he's, he is a, uh, a man of many hats, all centered around, you know, nature and birds and things like that. So I, I just think this is a cool picture. You know, a lot of times we see pictures of just birds, right? Just sort of yeah. sitting there. Terry oftentimes gets pictures of birds doing things like, you know, stopped after gathering and clearly is probably building a nest. Um, Dan, jump in anytime and interrupt me if you want to interject anything. I was just going to make, you know, for people that are tuned in right now, they yeah. see that the word, the name, the name of the, the bird is a dick sizzle. And I don't know what I don't know what percentage of birds are named after the sounds that they make, but if you go out into the prairie lands and you hear this little Dick Sissel sing, it sounds like Dick Sissel, and it's marvelous. It is a marvelous bird that's only found in the Midwest, basically the Midwest. Uh -huh. it's, it's a beautiful bird. I mean, he 
He now, is this a male or a female here that we're looking this at? This would be a male. Okay. In, in, bird, in almost every case of birds, the male is always the one that has the most coloration. And the, and the female, if you were to see a female of Dick Sissel right now, it would have almost no yellow around the eyes or the around the bill and none on the breast probably. And that, huh. that's the way that uh, the males can dissuade um, predators from hitting the nest and eating the eggs. I that's, see. Oh, I see. They yeah. just, it's distraction, I guess. Yes. I see. Look, look at me. Sort of like a kill deer <laughs> will fake a broken wing and draw yeah. predators off. Uh, they're more visible. So uh, going on down the road, here is another Dick Sissel. I don't know if it's the same bird or not, but I find this is just a beautiful picture. You Absolutely. Know? And, 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 and that, it, it, you can just hear him and know he's just singing at the top of his lungs and announcing his presence to all for all in the neighborhood to hear. So, so what I read about this bird uh, is that it's a, uh, it's an American seed eating bird in the family of cardinal. I, I guess it's a cardinal of a type, I guess. Um, and it says it breeds in the prairie grasslands of Midwestern United States. That's why we're finding them here in, Arkansas for sure, but they go down to Central America, Northern Colombia, and Northern Venezuela. So I, I imagine they, I imagine they do migrate. Yeah. So um, Scott, would you yes? like for me to play the Dick Sissel song? Yeah, let's hear it. I heard it. Yeah, you can hear it real clear. <laughs> So next week, I'm going to have some more pictures. And I, I just didn't think about it. Scott and I talked about it, and I failed to think about it. I'm going to download and loop for 15 or 20 seconds when the slide comes up the, saw, the sound of each one of these birds, which we can download from the uh, uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab. And uh, so we can hear the song uh, of each of these birds because they're all distinct and beautiful. And it fascinates me that people study this well enough to where they can listen and say, this is that bird and it's right over there. Uh, it's yeah. one thing to be able to visually identify, but to listen to the recordings enough and to hear the sounds enough in the wild to be able to say, I can do, that's a cardinal, that's a white-throated sparrow, you know, that's a chickadee, that's a nuthatch, you know, mm -hmm. the standard birds that I see from being out in the woods and, and around the farm, but to be able to identify hundreds of species by their song is just. Oh, that's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Just like, you know, I'm sure somebody goes, well, you know, your abil my ability to identify lots of stars is, you know, it it's the skill you develop. And sure. by the way, the pretty background that you see here is taken from Terry Stanfield's front yard. I'll see you get out of the way. Oh, yeah. yeah it's very see. nice. That's a picture that I stole off of Terry's Facebook page. And I want to, you know, thank him. I think he may be watching if he is. Thank you, Terry for letting us share your beautiful photos uh, to, a, to our audience. So next bird is a ruby throated hummingbird. And I didn't take the time to find out what flower that is. I'm sure Terry can tell me because he's really good with wildflowers as well. Uh, but, you know, to take that picture and to get that picture in focus exactly sharp on a bird that continuously moves, is, a, is an amazing skill, you know, and I'm sure he shot more than one picture to get this picture. He may have shot dozens or hundreds, but it's all in that to get that one perfect focus, mm -hmm. you know, nearly frozen action wing, uh, you know, and the, the flowers in focus, the plants are in focus in a very, very tight zone. Um, I think this is just a, a spectacular, beautiful photo. Dan, what you got on this one? It's the only, it's the only, um, hummingbird in the Midwest. It's um, it's it lives in the central fly, fly zone that um, that that basically comes from the Gulf all the way up through Texas and the mid states. But you will never see it in Colorado, and you'll never see it in New York or South ah. Carolina. It's hmm. the only one known to the Midwest, and it's a male because only the male has the reddish throat. And the female looks just like a regular hummingbird with no color. 
except the back will be would be green. All all hummingbird backs are green. You, you know this ruby throat. The, the iridescence is astounding when the light is hitting it just right. It, the depth of brilliance of color is just just absolutely magnificent. Um, you there know, are people that go to Arizona um, that uh, are building. They want to. They want to have a life list of the numbers of birds that they've seen, and if they want to get up to twelve different species of hummingbirds, they've got to go down south of Tucson. And uh, and the iridescence quality of virtually all hummingbirds is, like you said, Mr. Martz, unbelievable, spectacular. And when the light is right, it changes different colors. You know, um, uh, we've held the Arizona Dark Sky uh, Star Party uh, south of Benson at Karchner Caverns in Arizona. And uh, birding was a little bit of the first one we did. And we were going to make birding much more for the 2020 edition, but we all know what happened to that. Uh, so the, the 2022 edition is going to have a, a in September, is going to have a birding component to it. Uh, because there are so many birds, you know, and you that use that as mig migration route as well. You know, we were, I love being able to sit there and talk about identifying birds. We were at, at Mountain View uh, over in the Ozark Mountains a couple of weekends, last weekend, two weekends ago, and uh, there were hummingbirds everywhere. I could hear them, you know, they make a very distinctive sort of buzzing sound when they, when they fly around. And, and if you've ever been around a bird feeder, you, a, a, a a, 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 you know, a sugar water feeder, you know that sound they make. And there was just hummingbirds everywhere. Um, just beautiful. So uh, moving on, here is a picture of birds you don't see very often, you know, and, and Terry's ability to spot things is a testament to how fine he looks and how very specific he looks and searches for things like this. And uh, this is an Oreo. He did not say what it was. Um, I, he has some pictures of some uh, uh, Baltimore Orioles, which it's going to be, a, my guess, it's either going to be an Orchard Oreo or a, a Baltimore Oriole female. Dan, do you have any insight from yeah, the I, limited picture? Yeah, those, those are the only two Orioles that live in the Midwest. And it's a female because it lacks coloration. Now, if you were to right. see his her husband, so to speak, like the Baltimore, you would say, I have never seen a bird so cool in my life. The color, I wish we could just bring up one of Sheldon's pictures of a Baltimore Oriole male. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we'll do that next week. We'll, yeah, we'll, uh, I'll pair them up. It'll be all I Sheldon. Have... Yeah, <laughs> I did all not... Sheldon, all Orioles. I did not download. You know, what is sort of depressing in this picture to me is all that little white stuff almost looks like plastic, you know, and uh, you see bird's nest often made out of white plastic trash bags and things like that in, in yeah. many of these nests. And, you know, I, they use what they, it, it obviously it makes good nesting material. But um, when I was a kid, one time we were camping over on Beaver Lake and, it, and an Oreo was making a nest. And I sat there for hours watching them how to build this thing that if you look at it, is not hanging on that branch by, by very much, but yet it serves its purpose. Um, I found a, um, I recently found a bird's nest uh, over by the apartment I'm staying at. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I, I carried it upstairs and put it on my balcony because I just wanted to look at it and kind of study it. Within two days, <laughs> within two days, these so many birds had visited this bird's nest to take a piece of it to go build a new bird's nest, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, last year I parked my go ahead. It was just they just destroyed it, picked it apart, and recycled. Yeah, yeah. So, there was a bird's nest by where I parked my truck. There's a little maple tree, you know, in the parking lot, and um, there was a bird nest within three feet of where I got out of my truck every day. And it was so well hidden and camouflaged that I never saw it uh, until the leaves fell off in the fall. And I was like, wow, there was a bird right there. And I, I never noticed it because it was right there. Literally, my head was maybe two feet from it every morning 
but I never heard the birds peep and I never saw it. It was a Robin's nest, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's just cool that I was that close to it. Here is a barred owl in the okay. daytime. Yeah. You know, uh, beautiful bird. Uh, lots of different kinds of owls, aren't there? Lots of different kinds of owls in Northwest Arkansas and in, in the Midwest. Uh huh. Dan, anything to say? Yeah, the barred owl, I, I've, I've really been a birder by ear. And uh, the, they have, the barred owl has the most unique um, uh, call. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mimic it. And this is ex almost exactly what it sounds like at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it sounds like who cooks for you. Right. So if you were to go to any field guide that, that, that addresses the, the, the audio of birds, yeah. you'll say, well, that's a barred owl, you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's a, such a fantastic bird to hear in the middle of the night. Right. We had a couple of barred owls, uh, the house I lived in in Bentonville, uh, that would nest it in a pine tree out front. And yeah. to hear them start talking back and forth to each other in the spring, uh, and then another, when a crow came through the neighborhood, uh, <laughs> boy, they would get after that crow. And it was, it was a, a chatter fest uh, for them, <laughs> you know. And then other times, the, the owl would be sitting there, and the crows, a group of crows, I think it called a murderer of crows, would show up and spot him. And I think it was the male. And they would just sit there and harass him. And he just sat there so stoic and went, mm -hmm. I'm an owl and you're not. And I don't, no, you're not, and I don't care. And it just, you know, but when they had eggs, boy, they were protective of that nest. Yeah. So Billy Zastro uh, is commenting here. He says when he worked at United Airlines at, in Oakland, the birds used our disposable earplugs with lanyards to make nests in the in the hangar. Uh, oh. Blue string, yellow earplug. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, I mean. They, they use what materials at hand and what they can find. Right. And, and right. clearly that stuff is, uh, uh, fits their needs pretty well for nest building. So here's a, a migratory bird, uh, typically. A oh, that's beautiful. Through the air on its way north. It's a blue gross peak, gross beak. You know, a lot of people may just catch sight of it and think it's a blue jay, but if they eyeball it a little bit, clearly it's not a blue jay. It's a uh, spectacular, and gross beaks are large. They're large birds. Um, and then obviously they have very gross, meaning large beaks. Dan? Yeah, it, in fact, uh, sometimes you think, my goodness, whoever gave that bird that huge of a, of a bill, you know? But the gross beak is a great name. I want to yeah. address one other thing. You know, we're talking about this being a migratory bird. There's primarily three... Um, three uh, areas of the country. There's a Pacific flyway for migratory birds uh, of the Pacific coast, basically. Mm -hmm. Then there's a central fly zone, and then there's the eastern fly zone. So this is definitely a bird that um, that is migratory, spends their winters in Mexico, uh, and maybe some parts of southern Texas or southern uh, New Mexico. And um, it migrates up to the Midwest to have their, their broods, their babies. Oh. Very nice. I have a question for you. This is from uh, Michael. Michael versus the world is his handle. He says, is it true the birds are classified as avian dinosaurs? What do you think? Maybe in Michael's world, yes. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I think, know. I think I, I've heard of them. You know, they, they say that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps that uh, the dinosaurs have have, uh, you know, evolved into to birds today. Uh, one thing I'll, I remember, um, I was at the National Geographic Society and uh, they had claimed to find uh, the, the definitive crossover from a dinosaur to a bird, okay? And they had this thing, this big display, Dan, uh, it was in a glass case. And it showed this this thing with uh, looked like a, like almost ostrich like you know, but half dinosaur, half birds had feathers and all the rest of it. 
And um, uh, what happened was uh, this this find was was found in China, and it turned out that the whole thing was a hoax. That these these guys in China uh, that did this, um, that made this discovery or whatever, purported to make this discovery, had uh, had fooled the experts. You know so. Um, you know, sometimes in science, in the scientific circles, uh, people want, uh, you know, really reach out hard to, uh, uh, you know, prove theories or something like that. And uh, I think they can get lulled into uh, such hoaxes, you know, so sometimes but I'll never want, forget that. Sometimes you can want something so bad that you sadly get it. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So I don't know. But uh, the other thing that we talk about a lot too, uh, Dan, on on our shows uh, with with astronomers is uh, the importance of dark skies, and certainly uh, bird migra migratory paths have been affected by light pollution. You know, so this is something that um, um, is um, brought up a lot by the International Dark Sky Association. You know, I, uh, I I need to find that study I read about a couple of weeks ago and talked about it a few weeks ago about how they are able to count birds using the National Weather Service radars and the nighttime migrations on specific nights are staggering. And it's a very, they've established a very specific date and time and weather conditions. And uh, I'll find that and see if we can focus on that maybe next week. And, and the point being that they're traveling almost exclusively in mass on very specific nights mm -hmm. and it, no one knows it because you can't see them. You know, we're all used to like the starting video of, of this show of those giant masses of uh, blackbirds and starlings and such in these living waves and changing shapes and morphing almost like a single organism. Uh, we're used to seeing those in the daytime but those dwarf what happens on these specific nights. And they're now using that to have large cities in those pathways to turn off their lights on their skyscrapers and try and turn off as many lights as they can to, so the birds can navigate by the stars, which is what they use at night and to, to, to travel. And <clears throat> yeah, that'll be something interesting to talk about. We can highlight again, I'll work on that for next week. Sure. So sure. now here is a resident bald eagle. Um, it, um, there's a nest, uh, not on the eagle watch, but fairly close by. And uh, the lake uh, is a great source of protein uh, for the nesting pair. And um, it, it, they uh, uh, are a number of nests in Benton County now, some along the lake and some along some creeks. And, uh, you know, there's, there's an, I, I don't know the number, but there's maybe pushing a dozen nests. And if you ever see a bald eagle's nest, you know, people go, how do you know it's a bald eagle's nest? Well, you know, a hawk's nest is a big nest, but a bald eagle's nest is the size of, size of a VW beetle up in a tree. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, it's huge. These things are massive, weigh often tons, literally can weigh tons. There's so many sticks and branches. Dan, you want to weigh in? Yeah, in fact, as we look at this picture here, you notice that the bird has a white head and the tail is still black. Um, I wonder, wonder if people, how many people have actually seen a bald eagle when the, neither the head nor the tail is, is white. It takes them five years, takes them five years oh, to- Oh, wow, to you mean like that? Uh, that's called modeling. Right. Um, M-O-T-T-L-E modeling and uh they're losing their chain they're losing their their feathering and then new feathers will, will come up the new white ones will start coming out in the fourth year but in the fifth year they're full-fledged white head and white tail wow so, so what do you think this, this year, is this this bird is less than five years old i see so he's just got the white head and this bird is a year or two old probably uh yeah yes sir that, that's yeah. true, Ken. Now, and, and looking mm -hmm. at these, there you say, okay, these weren't taken recently. These are on dead branches of 
uh, trees in the water and yeah. that they're roosting on those. One of their primary sources of food is actually waterfowl. Yeah. And uh, since they're scavengers, they're really good for the environment because they'll go down and, and they'll uh, basically feast on um, waterfowl that are crippled or sick or just died. And uh, they, they clean up the environment. Hmm. And as, as, as d ducks migrate, let's say, south from Canada down through the United States and Central Flyway, the, the, the preponderance of bald eagles following the patterns of the migratory patterns of ducks oh. is almost simultaneously because they will be right there when they die, when these are sick or whatever, for whatever reasons, they become the prey. Yeah, I see. Very interesting. We saw a, um, we think we saw an eagle uh, as we were heading up through Missouri. Um, this was about three weeks ago and it had picked up a, uh, a snake. <laughs> My daughter saw it as it flew over our car, you know, but uh, it was, um, it was kind of amazing to see. The snake was about, I don't know, four feet long or something. And the bird's wingspan was bigger than that, so. Probably the average, uh, the average wingspan of a bald eagle is about between seven to eight feet. Wow. That's could, huge. Could have been an osprey. Uh, no. You don't think it'd be, you don't think it was an osprey carrying the snake? Oh, oh, yeah. sorry, Kent. You could be right about that. Yeah. But, but yeah. typically those are the two big birds around here, you know, mm. that would carry snakes. So, one's a really big bird, and the other one's just kind of like a hawk. Yeah. So <laughs> I think Terry shoots a lot of bluebirds. And uh, obviously, this is a brand new um, bluebird box that somebody's put up out there, uh, Eagle Watch. And uh, here in a few weeks, I suspect we'll see a picture of uh, little baby birds looking out of that same hole. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, or a mom. He's got some pictures from previous years of of the mama looking out of the hole and, and there's no perch on the, on the front of it. Uh, yeah, but he's got some where the bird is landing and, and sticking a bug into the, the hole for the, the mama that was inside, uh, to go. So just, yeah. just like I said, Terry really works to capture birds in action. A lot of times, uh, in North America, there are three <laughs> different, uh, bluebirds. This one here is the Eastern Bluebird and it's identified by the male having um, rusty, rusty reddish uh, head from the breast all the way up to the, to the forehead. Mm -hmm. And then on the, in the West, the, 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 the bib underneath the chin is all blue. And in, in the mountain states, it's called the Mountain Bluebird. They're all, the males are all powder blue without any mm -hmm. other colors. Really cool. Go ahead. Um, Kent, um, what I would like to do, we're, we're running up about, uh, we're, we're just about 14 yeah. minutes shy of five, okay. five o'clock right now. I would like to talk to uh, Dan about, you know, how to get started in birding, uh, you know, what it's like to be part of a, you know, uh, to go to a, a birding event you know that kind of thing because a lot of a lot of us might be interested but uh uh really don't know how to get started i want to um, end i want to end with this picture and you know this is a beautiful it's a beautiful picture, picture. it is yeah, yeah. You know, great great spang spangled fritillaries on butterfly weed i spelled weak um this is a spectacular picture and i put it up here don't just get caught up looking for the beauty in the birds Find the beauty that's all around you and, and don't be afraid to take pictures of it for the future so you can look at it and remember, oh, yeah, that's the day I saw, you know, whatever. It, it's all a big mental puzzle that we build to uh, remember things. And I think this is just a beautiful picture Terry took. I want to thank Terry for letting me use these pictures. Absolutely. Um, uh, he, he does great work. Um, he's a great outdoor naturalist kind of person who's really working to improve our environment. So Terry, thank you for being you, Terry. And y'all go find him on Facebook and give him a like. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. So Dan, 
what is the what's the path like? I mean, for somebody that uh, is a newbie, uh, might want to uh, you know is becoming fascinated with birds. Uh, uh, you know, I know that there's like the Audubon Society. Uh, I've been to some sanctuaries and stuff. But what, what's the best way uh, to really get involved in birding? The best way is to, first of all, have a curiosity. If you do not have a curiosity, then you have, you'll have no interest. Yeah. Um, so if you have a right. curiosity, one way. Uh, but more fundamentally is trying to challenge yourself to identify the birds in your backyard. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to a park. You don't have to go to a, you know, whatever. You just go to your backyard. You're going to see that there are sparrows and there are finches. Okay, what kind of sparrow? What kind of finch? Mm -hmm. um, so um, some are small, some are big. Understanding a little bit of the um, uh, uh, the structure of birds, what kind of a bill they have, whether it's a sharp one that likes to go and eat little seeds inside of plants, or whether it's a big gross beak that would eat something larger. It's just knowing a little bit about what the birds are. And that's one thing. But another thing, too, is if you could just get a pair of binoculars, typically seven or eight power, that would bring that individual bird closer to you, then the fascination begins. Right. Right. And I would, I would also add, too, if people are looking into, uh, into optics, I know you have excellent optics. Right. I'm, I've got a pair of uh, these uh, Alpen Tetons here, you know, that... Uh, I'm going to start uh, using, um, you know, to try to identify some birds and around our office. So one thing about binoculars to remember is the fact that the human body can hold seven power binoculars without without you having your hands moving like this and you can't hold it still enough. You need to put, put right. the binoculars on a, on a tripod. Seven power is the reason why the, the majority of binoculars sold are seven powers because the human body can hold seven power without hand tremor. If you go to 10 power, then you have a binocular good for, for astronomy, for just general astronomy, like looking at the moon or looking at like Jupiter or Saturn, uh, 10 power. But you might find after a little while that you're going to be shaking a little bit because it's beyond that seven power. And once you get to bigger than 10 power, you will need to have a tripod. Hey, Dan, I one trick I use when I'm out looking at birds and, and and, and for astronomy as well, get a fitted ball cap or a snapback. A one size fits all won't work, but you get a snapback ball cap or a fitted ball cap, and then you can put the binoculars up to your eyes and grab the bill and push the binoculars against your forehead and hold the bill of your cap, and that locks your head and the binoculars <laughs> in the same thing. And you can gain, you can reduce that, that handshake fairly significantly. And in astronomy, you can instantly see things that are, uh, you know, dimmer and, 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 and you gain detail. In birding, because you're holding still, you see the same thing. You will see more detail in the feathers and the rings around the eye and the shape of the bar on the wing and things like that that you need to identify birds and all those little details that make it better. Yeah, there's, there's really quite a lot to it, Kent, as you know. Um, like for example, if you want, to, if you're going to be looking far away from me, let's say 50 yards or whatever, and you want to see some detail, you better have a binocular that has a good field of view because you're not going to be able to find that individual unless you do have a field of view. And number of power, the wider the field of view, and conversely, the higher the power, the more the narrower the field of view. But I like that idea, Kim. I think I might use that. <laughs> yeah, you, you uh, royalty fees of, of one penny per bird. <laughs> so, so Dan, what what bird book? I mean, I grew up with the Peterson's. You know, I think it was Peterson's Field Guide. There's mm -hmm. all sorts of bird books. What bird? Needing a bird book is, I think, probably preferable to a iPhone to flip through, because you there's. But I don't know that. What are your thoughts on that? The known Bible, if I can use that adjective, the Bible of bird watching is the National Geographic Field Guide of North American Birds. Mm. If you have that book, that is the best. It doesn't include even one photograph. They are all drawings. 
because since birds molt, even non-migratory birds will molt, they'll change the appearance in the season of spring, okay? So in the National Geographic Field Guide to North American Birds, it shows you that bird with drawings by experts. They're total awesome in different plumages, okay? There's another thing that I would highly recommend. I was talking to Scott about this a couple of days ago. Yeah, there's there's it. something called right iBird. He's showing it right, showing it right now. It's called iBird or iBird uh, Pro. Yeah, iBird Pro. Okay. So see, it's got like all these different birds. I I literally just started playing with it this afternoon. So um, it is it is so fantastic because it has over a thousand birds in North America only, just North America. Oh my god! And most of the and then it has five to ten pictures of that bird, and most of them come from most of them come from Cornell uh, Ornithology. Uh, which they basically have the library of all the main, main bird uh, pictures in North America. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. I mean, Scott and I could go on for 15 minutes about how fantastic that is. There are some people, myself included, that will take the iBird with me and won't even take my National Geographic book. Really? So you're just using this. Now, you also mentioned, too, and, and uh, I'll, I'll help do some research on this, but um, uh, that there are apps now where you can just, like, hold up the, the phone, like, like the apps where you, you hit the button so it recognizes the music that's playing in the department store that you want to, <laughs> you want to know what it is. I guess there's apps now where you can hit the button and it can recognize a bird call. Is that right? There, that's true, but I've not had any experience with it. I know. Okay. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. uh, it's remarkable, and most of that, the data from which that is created is really Cornell uh, Laboratory of Ornithology. Very cool. They're legitimate bird calls. I mean, I gave you the hook hooks for you for the for the barred owl. Yeah. But you'd have the real hook hooks for you <laughs> on that app. Right. Very cool. Well, Dan, this is and Kent, this has been fun. This is this is uh, 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 taking me into uh, a new uh, arena, and um, uh, so I, you know, on those cloudy days when I can't be, when I'm not looking through my microscope or fiddling with, uh, you know, my my telescope, uh, certainly <laughs> hanging out with um, outdoors with a pair of nice binoculars, you know. Um, and I, you know, you mentioned seven power binoculars are really great. They're also great for astronomy too, you know, because uh -huh. uh, uh, you can see a lot of deep sky objects with them and stuff. And so, uh, and I know that you're an expert on binocular optics, Dan, and how to, how to pick them and all the rest of it. So we'll, we'll do a show just on that at one point, but, uh, um, but uh, we'll do this again next week. And uh, um Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Really Dan, enjoyed it. Ken, Ken, nice meeting you, buddy. I look forward to working with you, Dan. All right. All right. So uh, up next, uh, we're going to uh, trans uh, transfer over to uh, the Open Go To Community Live program with uh, Jerry Hubble. Um, so we'll have a little intermission and we'll be right back. Take care, Dan. Yeah. Hey, we'll talk to you next week, buddy. All righty. Take care. See you, Scott. Yep. And Kent, uh, that gentleman that, that supplied all those images, um, be great to have him on the show sometime. Uh, yeah, we've talked about it. Um, he... He's camera shy. He likes to be behind oh, the camera. Oh, he's camera shy. Okay. He likes to be behind the camera. He likes to be behind the like camera. That. Yeah, he likes to be yeah. behind the camera, not in front of the camera. I've, I actually asked him that a little while ago. And I knew the answer, but I wanted to ask. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll be right back.
Can you hear me, Kent? Yes, sir. Hello, Jerry. How are you? Good. I just watched your show. That's pretty good. Yeah, beautiful pictures. I, Terry does just a, with just you know, you know, mid level, you know, consumer level gear. Nothing. He doesn't have a huge high dollar, you know. Yeah, you don't need you don't cannon need launcher. You know, yeah, right. So uh, we had an eclipse this morning. Did you guys see some of the uh, uh, the partial? Boy, that things? one was spectacular, Scott. Yeah, you... I saw the saw the pictures. Are you going to yeah. share that one? Yeah, pull up some of them, Kent, if you get a chance. I can. Uh, let's see. I know that. Um, I think I'll go to email. Adrian Bradley, who's on our show a lot. Um, yeah. He did a very nice shot, uh, Jason Genzel. Yeah, I've got some in the email. Let me pull them out and drop them into a PowerPoint real quick while we're talking. Okay, all right. Sounds good. ends up there's a lot of uh i was just doing a quick search on facebook about um uh, arkansas you know this is the natural state right so you would expect that there might be a lot of birding groups and stuff like that and there absolutely is so there are there yeah. uh, they're everywhere you know um there's a group for everything on facebook if you haven't figured that out yet you know i mean I use that when I give my dark, my light pollution talk. I'll say yeah. proving, and I think you've heard my talk, proving that there's a group for everything. There's an international dark sky association. And that gets a big laugh. <laughs> right. Cameron Gillis says all pictures of the eclipse were excellent. <clears throat> we had a great uh, global star party last night too uh, with um, uh, Libby and the stars and Sabella Burlingame, also 11 years old like Libby is, uh, and also a uh, kind of a space exploration enthusiast. She was on for her first time. And then we had deep tea. So it was nice to have uh, three young girls or young women out uh you know, sharing their passion for science and astronomy is great. And then uh, we had, uh, you know, <laughs> Cesar Pro <laughs> was joking about how Argentina is taking over the uh, Global Star Party. It was funny. But it was. <laughs>
Well, hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts with the Explore Alliance, Explore Scientific, and, uh, and with the Open Go To community. And uh, today we have Jerry Hubble on with us. Kent Martz decided to uh, hang in there with us. Earlier, we were doing a show about uh, our first birding show called On the Wing with, um, with Dan George. And Kent had, uh, had um, found some really beautiful images uh, taken by a local uh, uh, naturalist here in Northwest Arkansas, so it's nice to show his work. Um, Jerry, uh, it's, it's been a busy day for you. We've been in several Zoom meetings on yeah. uh, new products and stuff that we can't really talk about right now. Right, <laughs> well, we could, yeah. but we're not going to. We can't. <laughs> it's no. not time. It's but, not time to talk but, about them. Right, it's not time, but rest assured, we are very busy working on several things. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um and uh, you know, so it's um, it's just been uh, nonstop here. Um, we uh, we wanted to uh, discuss some of the things that that's going on in the open go to community. And uh, Jerry suggested that we highlight some of the people that are uh, contributing things to the open you know the groups uh, uh, especially some of the beginners uh, asking questions, of course, but um, but people uh, submitting astrophotography. And yeah, so, like, that's right. So time to give some shout outs to some people here. It's been so. a while since we showed some pictures and we've got quite uh, a few new members of the forum that have started uh, generating beautiful images uh, with their systems. And so I wanted to highlight that. It's been a while, like I said, so sure. I didn't share my screen. And I'll bring up this. Um, so this is the um, our group, our main group message board, um, and we've got a long running thread that's got uh, several hundred messages. Actually, let's see if I can find out. Wow! I guess I'll look at this. Let's see, in this thread. Um, Where are you looking at, Jerry? Are you on Groups.io? On Groups.io. So if, if nobody's, if you're not familiar with it, Groups.io, if Scott, you can put a uh, link in it, but the link is up here. Oh, well. um, under main, let me go back. Let me just go to the home page and you'll see what it looks like here. So there we are, the trio, the original trio for the open go to community like today. Oh, right. Yeah, we need to update <laughs> that, right? Yeah. And, uh, but this is the forum that we created uh, four years ago now. It's been a little over four years. And in fact, you know, I was looking at the, at our YouTube videos and it looks like the first open go to community broadcast happened on June 4th of 2020. Oh, wow. So it's been just We've a, already had a year. A year, right, exactly. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is episode 155, isn't it? 156, something like that? Uh, is it? I thought, I thought I counted up to 152. I think, well, the one you posted yesterday, the day before, was labeled 154, I think. Okay, my bad then. So, yeah. 155. So, yeah, maybe. So, uh, anyways, over 150. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So that's that's at the top here. If it's it's uh, the group's IO link, if you posted that, Scott, that'd be good. And then uh, sure. So we've got this long running thread uh, called Astrophotography done with the uh, IXOS 100, XOS 2, and G11. Post your pictures and details. Let's show what these mounts can do. And this was started by this wasn't started by me. This was started by early on one of the uh, uh, on the members, members, huh? members of the computer community, right? So let me see. Let's let's go back. I'm going to sort this. Now, if you're watching, you you have not been on this particular site. Uh, you don't have to be a, an owner of PMC8 products from Explore Scientific or anything like that. There's a ton of information on there about it. Um, right. But um, it's it's a good group. Uh, it has hundreds of members and. Um, it, um, you know, a lot of these people are very deep into astrophotography, so. There's 768 messages in this thread. Wow. 
That shows you how many people have commented and posted pictures. I'm sure there's at least a good two or 300 photographs on here. Um, trying to move my little zoom window around so it doesn't block anything. So <clears throat> here's the first one that I want to highlight. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. that pretty big. big yeah. enough. So this is by user Mador Vyas. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's in, okay. he's in India. And uh, this is with a XS2 PMC8. Um, what does he say? And a Sony 6300 camera. It's guided. It's got a guide, guide scope. Oh, he's got a Pentax Takamar lens. Yeah, right. Yeah, 135 millimeter. It's not good for the... It says it's not good for the RC's focal length of 1370 yet. I say, yet I was looking for short, short exposure, so it worked. Beautiful image. So this is a stack of 20, looks like 107 images stacked. Uh, 30 seconds each so that's 50 53 and a half sec minutes of imaging <laughs> wow and uh that's pretty cool um there's a lot of detail in there that's with a dslr so that's pretty amazing there's a little galaxy it. just out of the frame oh yeah just off to the nope he's is it down here somewhere? I know no, there's there's one over here to the left a little bit. Let me zoom up a little bit more here and see if we can see it. It's on the bottom left. It's right there. There's a little cloud. Uh, there's a little. Keep going to the left a little bit. Keep going to the left. Keep going to the left. Keep going a little bit more left. Now go up, straight up. There's a little Y. Keep right there. Yep, I see it. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if people can see it on the screen, but that's yeah. Like, you can. It's. It's faint on the screen, but yeah, you know. yeah. that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can, you can do a lot in this, uh, with different, uh, images or with different, uh, cameras and things and DSLRs, even if it's not, uh, now he did 20 flats and 20 darks and it's not cooled. Of course, it's not a cooled, uh, system mm -hmm. like a normal astro camera might be. But that's just one example. And, and let me see if Medor, how long has he been around here? He joined, uh, oh, in December. Yep. Cool. And uh, so let's go to the next picture. Let's see what we got here. There's another comment. Uh, he said, I guess he captured that one before. Oh, here's a nice one. This is Robert. This, he says, my first upload, the Eagle Nebula. And look at that. Just Robert, huh? Yeah, that's his name. Let's see when he joined. Let me click on his name here and see when he joined. Uh, in December also, right after oh, wow. uh, right after, uh, right Very during cool. the holidays. Yep. It's his first astro photograph? That's, that's his first uh, upload. His oh, first, first upload. upload. Okay. Yeah. And he's using a PMC-8, it looks like, right? The XS2. XS2, yeah. Uh, and... He's got a guy. So he's an experienced astrophotographer. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like because he's got a guide camera and he's got other equipment. So six well, 300 but... second exposures. That's what he had. Yep. Mm. And ISO 800. And in Bortle 4.5, so he doesn't have great skies. He's got decent skies, but not great skies. But that's a very nice image. Yeah. Let's see who else we got here. I just, oh, this is a beautiful Look at that one here. One. Carol yeah. Trapala. This is a great, I'll click on it to enlarge it here in a second. But this is six and a half hours of exposure. And this is with an IXOS 100 now. Right, our little okay. mount. Our little mount. And it's got a, and a QHY 163M, which is what we have on the uh, Mark Slade Remote okay. Observatory. Mm -hmm. On a Tamron all, 300 millimeter lens. Yeah, so let me click on this here. Look at this. Wow. I need to zoom out a little bit to show the whole thing. Yeah, that's super. The Elephant Trunk Nebula. Super. Let me zoom, let me zoom back in a little bit. 
just to show all the detail. But look how tight the stars are. It just looks 3D. It's awesome. Yeah. So what's his uh, what's the exposure details there? Does he have it? I think. Uh, let's see. Let me go back. It says six and a half hours of exposure Does, time. It doesn't have any details. Uh, Darn it. Definitely narrow band type of imaging. Mm -hmm. Astro Pixel processor, Photoshop, Nina. It'd be interesting how many, how many seconds he was going. Yeah, right. How many, how many frames and everything like that. It's right. Great image. Carol Trapala. Let's see how long he's been a member. Oh, Since August. So for almost a year. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Uh, let's see who else. Yeah, we haven't done this in a while. No, this is cool. So Dave Cherry, who's he's pretty prolific. He puts out pictures a lot. Uh, so let me go back to the original. This one is done with 200. Uh, yeah. Skywatcher 72 on a PMC8 Exos 2. Exos 2. Yep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna click on it here. It's an Alex Stream filter. With an ASI 294 camera. Dave Cherry. Okay. Dave Cherry, yep. Uh -huh. I don't know why that's so slow, but look at that. It's a big image, I think. Bubble, the bubble Nebula. Bubble nebula. Mm -hmm. yep. what's, nice cool about the bu what's cool about the Bubble Nebula is the people have been taking pictures of it long enough that there's I've seen animations out there actually showing it getting bigger. Oh, yeah. That's cool. That's, that's like the one, the famous animation of the Crab Nebula over oh, ten yeah. year over ten year yeah. period. That's neat. So that's Dave Cherry. That's really cool. Good job, Dave. Don't know if he's watching. Probably not, but yeah, <laughs> maybe not. That's only an hour and fifteen minutes with no filter. With no filter, he's using well, and then he, and yeah. then forty five minutes or so with the L Extreme filter. Okay. You combine those two. So it's like two hours worth of imaging. And you can see people, Jenny, uh, commented on, uh, let's see, I think uh, Carol's, the, the one we looked at earlier. Yeah. Let's go to the next page, see what we got. Now, when I go to each page, it's going into the past. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, I can feel oh, look at this. <laughs> Pulled in. Now, this is another one by Carol Trapp. That's the one that Jenny I started was my on. astrophotography journey eight months ago. Unfortunately, due to mount issues, finally I've got a new one. And weather conditions, all the time clouds, I started to take some usable photos just about a month ago. Those are the first photos which I shared with somebody. So, so he's this got is that's the Axis 100. One. Yep. Yeah. Look at that. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm going to zoom up a little bit. On yeah. That. yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. Spectacular. Lots of detail all the way down to the core, you know. Oh, and here's, here's another one. Look at this. Heart Holy nebula. Smokes. <laughs> 40 by 120 seconds for each filter. You normally see this as the heart and soul nebula. This is so a this... 300 millimeter lens. On the IXS wow. 100. So they cropped it pretty good to get it, but that's impressive. Yeah, that's really cool. Look at the fine, you know, how tiny You think the it's stars a crop, are. Kent, or is this? Yeah, with, with, a, 300, with yeah. a 300 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, how big is this object? It covers a lot of sky. That's a, probably, I would imagine, um, a few degrees, maybe. Yeah. We will know in just a second because. All right, so we got Mike Lemus, which has a been a long term member yeah, of the. Of the uh, yeah, Mike's very good. He's he gets into three D printing a lot of. He's actually provided some some nice three uh, D printed objects for the community to do add stuff to the mount system. Yeah. So he's. So this is NGC 4216 in neighboring guy. There are 10, 10 three-minute exposures with each filter. And he's got a uh, Exos 2 mount, PMC-8. Look at that. 
That's very nice. It, it's wow. A, yeah. Heart, the Heart Nebula is 150 by 150. Degrees? Arc, minute, arc minutes. Arc minutes. Yes, yeah, so that's two and a half degrees. <laughs> Does it take up half the sky? Two and a yeah. half. So that's yeah, that's two and a half degrees. Yeah, so yeah. two and a half degrees. That's that's a lot of sky. Yeah, look so at it. look at all the galaxies in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. cool. Look over here. There's one there. Oh, ah, it's far away. Look over on the right. There's there's yeah, there's a little know, smudgy there's, thing there. Yeah, Cameron Gillis was doing his uh, cam astronomy uh, sky survey, and he was going. I mean, some of the photographs he had, and these are just like single shot. This is not stacked and all the rest of this, you know, and hours ten, and hours of exposure. Ten seconds with a Samsung phone. Right. Yeah. And he's and getting, he, he was getting galaxies that are like 500 million yeah, light years he, away. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's getting magnitude 15 and 16 galaxies. Now, it's just the central brightness, but by golly, he's getting it with a 10 oh, yeah. second exposure yeah. with a phone. So this is Mike's, uh, he's got this annotated version of the image right here mm -hmm. that shows That's you cool. all the stuff. That's, so let me, I don't know if we can see, let me zoom up and see if I can get it to be better. The resolution. It's going to get really big. <laughs> well, what's astounding is a lot of things we see as stars are really galaxies. Yeah. So there's all like these little things here all over this thing here. Mm. You know, there's a big one here. So that a lot of stuff that's mike lemus he's uh he's a long-term nice. member yeah very nice let me see Did I, I need to zoom out some more i think well maybe i don't know if my uh no all right so let's what's next dave cherry is, is responding to some other comments um let's see who else we got i may have to go to oh the wizard so oh here's hildo let's see when he joined and this he said this he is joined my, april 7th and this is his first attempt at guiding i saw that before you clicked yeah off. so this is what he's got um xs2 gt pmc8 and he's got these different telescopes uh so let's see what what he's what his picture looks like here First attempt at guiding the Wizard Nebula. So I'm going to click Bordelite. on that. Bordelite. Bordelite. So he oh, lives somewhere that. in a big city. That's really nice. Oh, yeah. Got to tight the stars. Yeah. He's got a little bit of processing artifact around yeah, his bright stars. Like, um, he'll get... It looks like salt. Oh, yeah. Black yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah, there is a little bit of blooming there i guess along but that's yeah that's the journey that's part of it yeah, that's right and and you learn how your instruments work and how they uh so this is this is a dslr mm -hmm. so you'll get you'll get those type of artifacts with dslr images i've noticed uh, looking at over the years you know, some of those blooming type stuff i don't know what that is exactly it's still a great but, camera to start oh, with oh yeah oh yeah sure hey Use with what use what you have to start that's right. with. Use what you have. That's right. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, look at that. There's the Andromeda. I mean the uh, I'm sorry, the Orion. <laughs> the Andromeda, <laughs> Andromeda Nebula. The Andromeda Nebula, right now. The Orion Nebula. <laughs> Looks suspiciously uh, <laughs> like the Orion Nebula, but a lot right. of people are fooled, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> especially especially me. <laughs> I never claimed to be a good deep sky guy. Okay, so what, what <laughs> telescope is he using here? Jeez. All right. He's uh he's got a deep sky. Yes, indeedy. So what what's uh I don't know. It doesn't let's see Charles. Charles oh, McEwen. That's, that's a, he's he's us. Yeah, he's been around for a while. He's been yeah, around. I remember him. Sure. Yeah. He he's now a customer service rep. Oh, is that Charles? Yeah. Okay. Charles, that's right. You sure so this is. is one of our astrophotographer. Uh, customer service reps. That's now. correct. Oh, nice. So let's see. What did he do? 15, uh, 180 second lights. He took uh, 10, 180 second darks, 15 flats, 15 dark frames again, stacked in DSS, stretched uh, and layering uh, in Photoshop, color balance, saturation, Annie's 
Astro Tool. What's I've Annie's never, Astro Tool? I've never heard of that. Well, we're getting ready to find out. Ask, Phone ask, knowledge. ask Annie about it. Maybe she knows. Yeah, maybe it's Annie and customer service. <laughs> so this is the 8-inch RC scope from Orion, which I've got. I've actually got that same scope. It's, it's a very nice RC scope. Um, got the quartz mirrors and all that. Mm. Um, it's a little bit tricky to do a collimation on it because it is a, an, a rcs are very RC, yeah temperamental that way yeah, exactly so but this is this is a nice he's got nice yep uh round stars all the way to the edge looks yep. like i'm not sure how big the field of view this kind of looks like it might be cropped i don't know maybe maybe not uh it's got the field flat it's got the 163 maybe it isn't mm -hmm. that 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 uh Annie's, it's called Annie's Astro Actions. Hmm. That's cool. So that's part of the, uh, that's a plug-in for the um, Photoshop. For Photoshop, yeah. yeah. I see. And there's here's a live session hosted by Annie Morris on YouTube. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Very cool. So it's a Photoshop plug-in. So this, this RC scope's got a 1600 millimeter focal length. And uh, so, so that may not be cropped very much. No, I, maybe, maybe not. Just squared. Okay, let's go to the next page. Right, just squared up, cropped. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, here's a nice one. Walter Vinci. Let's see when he joined in December. Looks like we had quite a few new members yeah. come in December. That's right. Uh, We're going to have a lot more new members here in a couple of months when the uh, XOS2 and PMCH show up and then the Exos 100s, we're going to see a blossoming of membership. Sure. So this looks like it's one of his first times trying to do uh, narrowband imaging with the well, L Extreme filter. Mm hmm. And uh, so I can zoom up. That's North American Nebula. North American Nebula, right. Mm hmm. On its side in terms of our. It, Our way of looking at it. <laughs> turn, turn so it looks like North America. Gillis does. says, uh, and ED80s, right, Kent? Question mark. Oh, ED80s coming in stock? There's there's some in the future. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty open statement. There's some in the future. Yeah, let's, yeah, put, that. It's like, let's yeah. put you back into marketing. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's well, right. hey, I promise we will get some. <laughs> yeah, my, my Uncle Charlie uh, used to... Uh, uh, challenge his uh, his uh, his co-workers and you know he would gamble with them and he'd say I'll I'll bet you whatever you know that it's you know it's going to rain today you know and of course you know it was rain today somewhere right he never would qualify <laughs> where yeah right <laughs> all right here's another DSLR image of um, M51 two of them Daryl Oliver He's been yeah. around. He's been a uh, fairly long-term member, I think. Well, he joined a year, a little, a year and a half ago. Uh, Has an XS100. Yep, XS100 mm -hmm. with the heavy-duty nice. tripod. Now that's the extra. Well, has he got yeah. an AstroTech AT80 ED? Mm -hmm. Feel flattener. He's powers it with our power bank. And he's got a Meet Infinity ST80 with Lunt Solar Dual Speed Crafer Focuser. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, and a Mead Polaris 90 with the GSO dual speed Crayford focuser. And a Mead Polaris 130 with scope stuff Crayford focuser. So he likes the different focusers. Yeah, yeah it looks like it. He he's does. Been, he's been uh, messing with different ones to see yeah, which one works. Cameras, uh, yeah, cameras, guide scope. Nice. Yep. nice, nice Daryl. So let's see. Let's look at the first one here. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. That's a nice wide field. Yeah, that's cool. I always like to take pictures like this. I've got one that I did that I really love of the ring nebula, but it's really tiny in the center. And it mm -hmm. shows you the vastness of the of the galaxy with all of stars mm -hmm. around it. Oh yeah, in the field uh, of the Milky sure. Way, you know, in the field and it's really a, it's an amazing picture, I think. Uh, and it shows good detail down down inside. If you zoom up on the ring nebula, you'll see everything that the sky can give you. If you do correct critical sampling on the imaging, you'll get every bit of the detail you can see, even with a wide field camera <laughs> uh, scope. 
you can see the in that picture there's a little hint of a galaxy off to the right yeah here's another one so what are you talking about you can just in the other image you can see it a little bit there's a little oh. bit of nebulosity sticking in all right let me see here i'll go back to that one see it right down here? there to the right there's oh. yeah there's a galaxy right there but right over here to the very right oh i'm blocking up. my picture's blocking it maybe I've got my right. zoom window right here. Right there, yeah. Oh yeah. See, just I gotta move. Of it. You don't see my zoom window on my screen like I do. Right. Mm. It covers up things. All right. Let's. Uh, that's cool. So uh, that was Daryl. Up oh, here's another one. Steve oh, look Seedentop. at that! Look at all these galaxies. Yeah, yeah. Steve Seedentop. He's been a yep. member for a while. Yeah. yeah. He's the he one met of our Steve at. Um, uh, I was with Greg Bragg, and we went to the uh, Peach State yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Star Party. And uh, Steve was there with a, a group of guys. They all had Explore Scientific refractors. Um, and it was the first time I'd really seen, uh, you know, some of the customization that these guys do with uh, uh, single board computers, you know, which I now have done myself. But um uh, it was really cool, uh, and they these guys were all dialed in. They were just sitting back, uh, you know, in their uh, zero gravity chairs or whatever, you know, <laughs> or hanging out inside of the tent, controlling their telescopes outdoors, you know, as they uh, sipped on a cognac or something. That's right. Let me zoom up on this image too. Some more. And he's Steve is very good. Oh and, yeah, and, and he's shooting from Atlanta, which you know has no light pollution at all uh yeah right <laughs> well I, I don't i don't know if he's if he's suburban down yeah, it, yeah suburban atlanta it says from backyard in the suburbs of atlanta really okay right yeah here. he's got light, pretty pollution. light polluted in the suburbs yeah. of atlanta that's true not really a galaxy scope and i'm pleased with the results okay mm -hmm. yeah cool so I'm he's got too. he's got a g11 yeah the Rulon couplers, which are little nicer couplers and a one piece worm block. And so we've gone, he's done a lot of work with us over the years uh, with our system. Uh, spell yes. his last name. I'm trying to look at the top. It's S S I E D E N T O P. -O -P. Had the I and the E backwards. I'll be able to get his address. And he joined, he joined basically, he was one of the first people to join when I created the group. You can see there in 2017. Yep. And when I've is been this talking, image submitted? When do you think that? This is a recent thing? one. This was on um, April 13th. Oh, wow. Pretty recent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So let's see. Let me zoom back out a little bit here on the page. Is that, that's another... Well, here's a Jamie Murdoch. Here's another. Uh, I don't recognize the name. Let's see when he joined. In December again. Wow, that's amazing. What happened in December? Well, apparently we had a something in stock. December. It's interesting. Yeah, we had some stuff in stock. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so this is he lives in Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. He says he's really thrilled with the mount so far and have been learning a ton in addition to the open hardware and documentation. The encouragement and engagement on this forum was a deciding factor in his purchase. So we always love, love to hear that. Yeah. He's new to the hobby. Look at that. Having picked up uh, the hobbies in May. Wow, he's new to the hobby. He's doing this well. Yeah, look at this. I'm jealous. Triplet. Yeah, look at that. Uh, yeah. Let me zoom up on it a little bit. I don't, you know, we're not pixel peeping. We're just trying to show all the detail that the image has oh look at that look at the nice it's ngc 3628 it's a really beautiful galaxy mm -hmm. that's very leo nice. trio and look at the look at the little detail in the arms here yeah okay so steve lives in Bordeaux class six see no oh, okay that's that's pretty high he lives on the very fringe of the white area Mm -hmm. around Atlanta. This, but uh, his backyard's in the middle of Albuquerque, a portal seven and eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. 
Yeah, it's amazing with the with the cameras we have today, what you can see. No flats, 20 darks. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's just just the ease it is to stack. I mean, man, when I started trying to do and started reading about stacking, you had to import the picture into Photoshop and go into layers, then bring the other picture in and make the transparency and try and rotate it and you know and line it up yourself by hand. It, it, it was hard. I mean, yeah, hard. Let's see. Oh, here's another. I think I've been through these. I must have gone back a page or something. Let me go back where we were supposed to be. Let me see here. I think we looked at these. Oh, there's one that's new. Let's see. Where'd it go? That's the one we just looked at. Yeah. Jamie Murdoch. So I'm going to go down here. I'm going to I'm going to skip a couple here to go to this one. I want to see. This is uh, stayed. I don't know who that mm -hmm. is, but see when let's see when he joined. Oh, in March, March of last year. I see. Ixos 100 again, DSLR. Mm -hmm. So that's what's that's the perfect setup for the Ixos 100 is a DSLR system. Yeah, Scott, that's how you and Jerry designed it. That was the wheelhouse for it, wasn't it? It wasn't necessarily designed for telescope. No, so when my my initial thinking on the field of view or the focal length for this mount was going to be like 400 millimeters at the most. But people have blown past that. Oh, my God. Yeah, for well, sure. Yeah. Joseph sure. Richard, you know, shooting what, a, a C6 or something? Well, some, I don't know. One guy, I can't remember who it was. I apologize. But he was... Um, where did that go? Hey, this thing keeps going back to some other picture. I want to go back to Stade's picture here. It keeps hopping it back to the... I know. I don't know why it does that. I want to go to number three. Um, I mean, there's people using 1900, 2100. I mean, long Maxitovs and Schmidt Cassegrains. Oh, here it is. Stade. That's his picture right there. So yeah, so exactly. There's two pictures. Yeah, it's stacked. What? So M eighty one eighty two. That's what was throwing me off. Yeah. And M thirty three. Okay. M thirty three. Right. That's. I was sitting looking at it going. I was going. That's M eighty one eighty two. But what's that galaxy right? Now? I don't remember a galaxy yeah, right next to it. Yeah, I've done M thirty three. I've done photograph. That's a triangulum galaxy. I think is what that's called. Uh, but yeah, that's that's gorgeous. Let me let me uh, zoom it zoom, zoom in. Yeah. You know, after uh, on the Global Star Party yesterday, last night, you know, the um, explanations of uh, star formation and stuff by um, Kareem Jaffer, uh, you know, Professor Jaffer's, it was really very um, informative. You know, on how uh, certain stars are. Uh, you know, the way that they're um, evolving, uh, you know, and creating different types of, you know, like T-Tori stars and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, creating Nova, you know, what creates a Nova where, you know, uh, you've got a, a binary star, you know, uh, uh, I guess a white dwarf that's get, drawing off material off of a, a red giant and the material right. as it hits the star, you know, the surface of the star is making this Nova, you know, so. Well, it, it accumulates enough to where all of a sudden it says, I don't want it. I don't want it anymore. I'll shed it. Yeah. <laughs> it right. Winds up. So then it's a, it's a, and that's why it's a, a standard candle because that, that type of star, I think accumulates an X amount of stuff that's known and it's always the same. Mm -hmm. So once it blows it off, you know, when it blows it off, that it's reached that brightness. And that's why that's a candle for the, for the type of, for the right. And uh, it's, so that's, I think that's part of it. Um, Gary Albin says this year, France enacted some of the most stringent regulations to fight light pollution. I wish the United States would follow suit. Freedom. I can pollute. Yeah. That's, for no reason that's uh part of it uh people people yeah people have freedom to do what they need what they want to do and but all you can do is uh educate people yeah that's but you have the freedom to sue them 
That's right. Yeah, and you have a freedom to educate people, and you have you know to tell them why they're why it's a bad thing that they're yeah. doing, you know, and it, tell them it, and explain. It is amazing to see people try and justify why a light fixture shining up in the sky is perfectly acceptable and it causes no problems for anyone. Mm-hmm. And That's when you talk true. about full cut off shields, they hear you take that light down, and it takes time to yeah. If you can explain to them why what why it's more effective, you get more more use out of your light when it's pointed at the ground. When all the light is pointed right. at the ground, right? When you reflect yeah, it's it, not down. Like if you're going to wa- get water running out of your hose, you don't want to water the the other guy's lawn, right? You want right. to water your lawn, right? Exactly. So it's your bill that you're and, paying. So I think most people understand that once you explain it that way. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't leave your leave your hose half on all night long, <laughs> right? Gary Alden says that that type of freedom is called ignorance in many other countries. <laughs> well, people are free to be as ignorant as they want to be. That's, that's there you go. <laughs> that's what it is. I mean, you can be as smart or as, as uh, dumb as you want to be about any topic at all. You know, it's freedom. All right. So let's see what else do we have. Paul Mogg, Whirlpool Galaxy M51. Let's see when he came on. Uh, oh, about almost a year ago. He's from Spain. Yeah. Alicante, Spain. So what Gary Alban was talking about is France adopting national light pollution policy um, among the most progressive in the world. The new law came into effect in France on the first day of 2019 that sets an important standard in Western Europe for the protection of nighttime darkness through controls on the emission of light in outdoor spaces. So we don't want to talk about that in the United States because anything French do, we don't want to do. Uh, well, it's the it's the standard, not invented here type of man- mindset. You get it with individuals, you get it with countries, you get it with groups and companies and all kinds of stuff. You know, people like to have their own ideas and implement them. All right, this is Paul Mogg. He okay. joined last year. He's actually using a Linux. I guess it's Linux. He's using K Stars and Ecos and Indy driver on his Explore Scientific. And that's the thing. Mm-hmm. That's the nice thing about our system also is that you can use it on practically any platform that's out there now uh, with the Indy driver or the ASCOM driver. And this is, uh, let me click on the M51 60 by 120. Oh, look at that. That's really nice. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of detail there. Yeah, love that. Let's see if it goes better. My amateur astronomy career, I've seen two supernovae in M51. Oh, have you? That's good. Yeah. So he says he's he's uh he's been trying to learn to take pics for six months. So he's a he's a relatively new user also. That's and interesting. He, he joined in September, right? He joined last September. And right. when was this post made? The March nineteenth. March nineteenth. So done pretty well for six months. So great. Yeah, it took me. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while before I could get up to that level. A, a couple of years at least. Uh, of course, I don't do deep sky stuff anyway. So <laughs> keep saying that, except for testing. Keep being, Keep seeing deep sky stuff, and after you show us, you go, I don't do deep sky stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> my stuff is is basically like beginner level, like stuff these people are doing today after six months. That's what oh, my yeah. stuff is like. Well, people, yeah, they they drill down, and they, yeah. they get real good, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. you're very good at doing science, Jerry, so that's yeah. your deal. Oh, look at this. Dave, Dave Cherry again. Let's see. Some very nice galaxy images for you guys. Just never seem to have much luck with. I never seem to have much luck with them. I'm just about to change back to the next or to the Newtonian and have another go this year. Mm-hmm. Let's scroll down. And look at these pictures. Yeah. So. All right. Yep. So he's got several pictures here. Look at the. Wow. Maybe we've looked at a couple of these already, but let's look at this one. The, Horse head. Horse head. Oh, look at that. It's beautiful. Detail. Iconic. It's great. Look at, look at the stars. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. Let's see. What else? 
This is with um, is that the Triffid? That was that? This is ASI two ninety four camera. Okay. You want to see the Triffid? That's a that's not the Triffid, is nope, it? No, it's not. No. It sort of looked like it. But it's got not. the colors of it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't got know what faked that is. out. What, what is, is that? that? Is that the row of got a labeled? Oh, the spider nebula. Oh, look spider at that. Spider nebula. That's wow. interesting. It's got really colorful, like the like the Triffid. Yeah. Kind of looks like um, I don't know something like you'd see on Earth, and people do these pastel color lights. To do stuff yeah there. that gold one it really adds a weird color to it right there in the yeah center. right all right a so gary, gary alban says all right guys i'm going to set up the ed127 for the first time in over a month uh, of cloudy skies here in uh Bortle 9 miami miami oh see you later on the gsp thanks for the great uh content tonight so cool all right thanks, here's gary. The, uh, that's a rosette Wow. wow, that's beautiful. Look, Look at how bright that. it's, yeah. The saturation levels. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gold and red. Yeah. You know, and that's what I like about seeing how different people interpret their data. You know, this is not where people standing next to each other with a camera both go click and take the same picture. You know, there is a vast amount of art and interpretation and processing. Yes. And you know, you can flip the colors to something different. You can use different palettes. You can use fewer of some channels right. and more of others. It's just and, a different way to interpret it, but also bring out some details that you may not normally see. Also, that's another right. reason to do it. You know, it, it's, you know, in black and white pictures of, of, say, Saturn or Jupiter, you can see more detail of certain kinds than in color pictures that mm -hmm. the color hides and, you know, it's all just, they're all different. Everybody has right. a different way of looking, of, of dealing with it. Right. Let's see. Uh, this is, do you know what this is? That's a, that's, that's the, the uh, Andromeda Nebula. Andromeda Nebula. You beat me <laughs> yeah, to it. Right. You yeah. beat me to the it. Andromeda Nebula again. <laughs> but the big problem with shooting the. Oh, the, yeah. He, he got that wrong there. He says uh, it's the Orion Nebula. The Orion, we uh, know what uh, it really is, right? <laughs> you know, shoot, shooting the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, otherwise, maybe known as the Orion, the Orion Nebula. Nebula or M42, M42. M42. The surface brightness is so much that you you end up burning out the trapezium and all that deep. Yeah, that's right. okay. Right. Look right. at the look at the detail. It looks like yeah. a cascading I, waterfall of, this, of yeah. dark nebulosity and light. I, I can remember Jack Newton in about I don't know 2000 or 1999 at, yeah. at the Winter Star Party. Yeah. Showing people how he used Photoshop to merge four or five pictures together to achieve a even, you know, short exposures, a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Little, so he gets all the everything in there in one picture. It's a high dynamic oh, range. Yeah. Picture. And he yep. creates a, a manually was creating high dynamic range images. And we were in the uh the 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 building there at the at the Girl Scout camp and and people were just in awe. Of what he was doing with with, with oh, yeah. Photoshop, it's yeah. like yeah. like Ansel Adams the way he used yeah. to do black and it's white a, stuff. It's exactly what it is. It's his own system, it's just to do a new expression of the zone system. But uh, yeah, Dave Cherry does excellent work. Good job, Dave Cherry. Let's see. There's another M Jeff Weiss or Paul Meesters. Paul Meesters. Um, yeah. He joined. He's from September. the Netherlands. We've talked to Paul. We've worked with Paul quite a bit, I think, with different things he's been he had with his mount system. But I think he's he's uh, likes it a lot now that he's worked through uh, different things that he was going mm -hmm. through with his system. So he took a different approach than a lot of people. This is 100 two second exposures. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And it, what was the camera? It's an ASI 071 MC Pro one shot color. So that's a CMOS camera, which is a lot of people say that that's the way to do it with CMOS cameras. They're really sensitive, especially the back illuminated ones. Just go really, you can do short, really, really short exposures, of. right? To, to minimize the tracking error to the bare minimum, basically. Yeah. Mm hmm. Although the better you're tracking, the better you're going to be. Oh yeah, absolutely. But this, this is so. This is only 
200 seconds or, um, you know, three minutes, a little over three minutes of exposure combined. So you can see quite a bit of detail. So there's different techniques and different ways to use your system and you get different results. Some, and the biggest thing is just experiment. If you don't like what you, if you don't like what you get, you know, understand what your system settings are and then change something and see if it gets better. That's called, and write it down, write, write it down. down. Yeah, exactly. Because if you don't write it down, you don't remember what you did. Um, the difference between playing around and science is when you're doing science, you write it down. I mean, right. you know, Jamie Savage or, or Adam, what's his name off of uh, Mythbusters? You know, the difference is write it down, but change one variable. Don't change two variables. Change one variable, document what happened, then change another. Because if you change two things, you don't know what you did to cause the effect you like, and you right. can't recreate it. Right. I thought I, this thing went back to, uh, I guess it's on five. There's another picture of the Andromeda Nebula. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna Somebody's going to watch this show. We're going to confuse gotta... people. I know. We're going to. That's We're actually need a... psychotherapy. This <laughs> is this is not the Andromeda Nebula. There's no such thing. This is the right. Orion Nebula. Well, there is an Andromeda Nebula. Before... Well, it used to be. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's before right. we discovered that it was really a galaxy. Right. It was. And the Andromeda when Hubble Nebula. ruined it by making it a yeah. galaxy. Yeah. Right. Right. Force... Oh, here's. Here's a beautiful picture, Jennifer Shelley. Oh, wow. Jennifer, that's awesome. This is on her. So she owns all three of our mounts. The I didn't G11. know that. Yeah, the G11, the Exos uh, 2, and the Wait iPhone. a minute. I did know that. She talked about that on yeah. one of the shows. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. on the Six iPhone. Six hours of narrow band data for the rosette from my Ascar FRA 400, QHY, uh, 600M yep. and a QHY filter wheel, filter wheel yep. Bader Nebula filters, Bader SD2, and IXOS PMC8 mount. That's a 100. Yeah. What? That's the 100. That's the wow. 100. 100. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let me zoom up on that a little bit. That's great. That's that's got amazing detail and a lot of stars. It's six hours of exposure. That's that's, uh, that's calendar worthy right there. Oh look, yeah. Look at all the dark nebula in there, all the dust lights. Oh yeah, all this little detail, all this little tiny stuff. Yeah, those, those little you know pillars of creation kind of thing. But over here in the top left, just outside the bright area, those dark tendrils that go off into the night, so to speak. Over here. Yeah, those little dark light right there was when you just went past. Yeah, one. right here. Uh, keep coming down to right to the right, just a little bit up, up straight up. There's just a dark little finger. Keep going up. Keep going up. Right there, you're almost on top of it. There's just a dark finger that just goes out through there of dust. Mm hmm. I once was a tendril that went off into the night. <laughs> And there's a long, yeah, there's, there's a long one right there. Yeah, right along here. You can see these tendrils, these Scott notice, Robert tendrils. Notice we didn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to touch that. Jerry touched it. I it is beautiful. It. it is. But I, look at this right here. Look at the, look how crisp this is in the detail. Look at the tiny little. Go, zoom in on that, Jerry, a little bit. Is uh, Jennifer watching? I don't know I don't if she know. is. See if she is. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at this. That's amazing. And those little pillars of nope. creation up She's in the center. Unless she's sitting back, not chatting. Yeah. Could she's be. Lurking. She's lurking. Lurky. That's pretty well zoomed up on this thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, All right. well. You want to look at some uh, eclipse photos? I've yeah, let me four. stop. I'm going to stop yeah, my share. That was good. That was a good very nice. survey of very what's nice. been happening in the last few months. Yeah. I have to do that more often, Jerry. I think that's cool. Let me see if I can not lose my mouse this time. Yeah. And my keyboard's been doing some really strange things. So Yeah, we couldn't oh, hear. Reboot your computer. 
We couldn't hear. Maybe it's a tendril earlier. that does uh, tendril. messing up your hard drive. Yeah, I lost my <laughs> mouse and I couldn't, so I couldn't unmute. Okay, so here we go. I thought the space bar might be able to do the mute unmute thing. I don't know. I don't know. So this is a picture uh, Stella Kaufman took. Um, you know, sometimes. Share your desk. Share your picture. I thought I had. Did I not? No, nope. I don't see it. Well, no. I believe you. There we go. This this shows oh, yeah. you mm -hmm. take a picture oh, with, yeah, Stella. with what you have to work with. Is you that know? Stella's image? Yeah, this is Stella's. Okay. Adrian uh, Bradley did an image. I thought, well, okay. It might uh, I be, think a, I thought, it was, is it Adrian's? I think if, that's Adrian's. If that's story. Adrian's, I strongly apologize. I so, think that is. To, let me see if I can change it real quick. Yeah, I think that you were looking at a uh, email a stream and Stella was commenting on it. Well, hang on, because I want to get that off of... Yep, Cameron says it's Adrian. I agree. I'm changing it. Bradley, right? Bradley. Too many screens open. There we go. So Adrian Bradley, you, you work with what you have. When the clouds offer you a partially obscured sunrise annular eclipse, you take pictures of it. So Adrian, if you're watching, sorry about misidentifying your photo. I, back in, uh, I think it was in 2012, I had the same issue with the Venus transit. It was late in the day and yep. clouds that were going in and out. And I got some pictures of the sun with the Venus transit like that also. Yeah, which actually gives it a little bit of flavor. I mean, it adds some some context to the photo, maybe a little bit. Uh, and I like all the birds flying around in it. You know, they oh, add yeah, sort of another, a, yeah, in the in the ocean view and stuff. Yeah. It's all it's a landscape photo kind of, but it's also with an astronomy an astronomical event. Yeah. And that's what Adrian does. He he does a lot of landscape photos with astronomy about astronomy and mm -hmm. beautiful work. Okay. It's cool because you see all different scales of, of nature from the close to the far away. So I've got another Miss Label here. I remember Miss Label. She was a good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I dated Miss Label. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> well, no. she, she would always have that label, you know, sticking out the back. Yeah, but she, was a, she was a librarian. So, you know, Miss oh, Label. Oh, was she? Yeah. <laughs> She was she or Miss Libel? Was it Libel or Label? I can't remember. No, she worked yeah. with Dewey Decimal. Dewey. <laughs> they, came, they came up with a system. That's right. We haven't been drinking. No. Uh, yeah, we, we, need, drinking? we need to start drinking. As, as... Okay. So this is a uh, Pekka. Pekka. I misspelled oh, his name. Yeah. This is a picture Pekka took in uh, Stockholm. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a... Uh, you know, a, a pretty picture. You know, I, I, we didn't get sent any of the annular of the, the ring of fire. Um, kind of started starting to look a little like Pac-Man. Yeah. The Pac-Man eat. I, eat, I wish yeah. we would have had somebody would have sent us one, but I didn't want to pull some off the Facebook or the internet of people that mm. hadn't sent them to us. But mm. these are all friends of the company and of Global Star Park. about Jason so, Gonzalez? Did I you didn't, find any? I didn't find any from him. He didn't send any to us, and that's what I was looking for. So here is uh, Korean Jaffa. Oh, yeah. From Montreal. Uh, he did, did not put any ring of fires in this. He was going to work on one that he had, but he did not put it in this quick assembly. So, um, you know, very pretty, standard. It's with you know, a smartphone and an eyepiece. Yeah, an eyepiece, 32 millimeter plus eyepiece. Yeah. And then. Yeah, that's very nice. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Saved it for last. Jenna Hines from Toronto. Yeah, you know, that was really nice. If you didn't, 
<coughs> excuse me. God bless you. Uh, excuse me. You know, if when I looked at this, I was like, the, the eclipse didn't happen in Iran or Iraq. You know, and, right. and because that's what this looks like. This kind of looks like from the Middle East, right? They Absolutely, have the crescent, it does. They have the crescent, and uh, yeah, it looks like it's from the Middle East, and it's from Toronto because she lined it up with whatever that tower, the Space Needle, that's or the, whatever it's the called, Toronto Tower. I don't know what it's yeah, called. Yeah, whatever it's called, Space Needle. Did in you Seattle. show the um, that partial phase uh, series done by Kareen early? Yeah. Right here. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, Very shot nice. through an eyepiece. And then he, had, yeah. he fought the clouds, obviously, you know, but it tells the story. I mean, that gives a little interest. Yeah, that gives some interest to it. It, it tells the story of the eclipse for, that he had. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's his story, you know, and I think we get caught up sometimes wanting to have these perfect images with no clouds and no that's, this. That's and, there's a, a whole branch of study on that. It's called history. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, Jerry, you always keep coming up with them, you know? It's amazing. That's a, that is a, <laughs> it's that's astounding. A, yeah, this is a poster worthy. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be good for a postcard. And, or, and this would be, oh, absolutely. And this would be her story, not his story. That's right. Is that Seattle? Is that where that Toronto. is? Montreal. Toronto. Okay. Or Toronto, I'm sorry. I yeah. see. Yeah. Great job, Jenna. Yeah. Beautiful. So there we go. There we go. Great. Well, gentlemen, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a wrap for today. You guys have anything more that you wanted to share? No, I thought it was a really good light uh, program. Yeah, get into too many technical details, but show a lot of photographs that everybody's everybody's doing great work out there. Harold Locke wants to give a shout out for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Facebook page. It had a tremendous picture of this morning's eclipse. So um, we want to uh, thank our audience for tuning in today. We had, you know, a double feature here with birding and astronomy and uh, Thanks for tuning in to that. Um, we will have Dan George on weekly uh, to uh, talk about uh, birds on, on the wing. And uh, uh, Scott will figure out exactly which show that this was and correct said, his, uh, yeah, right. his episode here. That on the wing, you said it may not be all the time about birds. It could be flying insects too, right? I guess. Could be bats, I you know. We have these bats. Huge right. bat. We have these. Bats in Arkansas that have like a 14 inch wingspan. Mm. I mean, they look like flying foxes. They're huge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the tower in Montreal or in Toronto is the CN Tower. Oh, right. The it's CN 553 tower. meters and uh, over 1800 feet. It's a concrete tower and it is a communications and observation tower. Mm -hmm. hmm. And an icon of the city. It was named CN because it's referred to the Canadian National Railway, the company that originally built the tower. Huh. Excellent. All right. All right. You know, if you have questions and don't Google the answers, you don't become good at Trivial Pursuit. Right. There you go. Pekka says, thank you, guys. You did it again. Held me occupied the whole evening. <laughs> It's pretty it's late over there, isn't it? How, what time is it there? Probably two o'clock in the morning or something. Maybe, maybe not that yeah. late. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, 103. 103. Okay. 103. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Becca's just waking up. Yeah. <laughs> so he's seven hours behind us. Mm hmm. Yep. All right. Well, Gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, Tomorrow, uh, Scott is taking a day off um, uh, to take care of some personal matters. Um, so there will not be a uh, Microcosmos Voyages program uh, on Friday. 
Uh, we will be back on Monday uh, with more of our programming. And uh, Tuesday will mark the 50th Global Star Party. So, awesome. Awesome. Yep. Maybe you start yep. thinking about maybe running reruns on certain programs if you're not going to be there or something. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know how you could arrange that or schedule it on your system. They do it by themselves. They just find it and rerun it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Problem is, we've only had three microcosm journeys. Nope. So I have, I have taken shows from before and streamed it live. Okay, and uh, I don't like doing it because people think that it's live. Oh, right, know, right. right. Mm -hmm. Instead of a recording, and they're wondering why you're not interacting or answering their questions, or right. you know. And so I, I don't. You'll have I don't to know. put a put a label up in the corner that says a re rebroadcast or something. Rebroadcast. That's right. Like an I Love Lucy show. Yeah, or right. Something. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyhow, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, it was really um, it was a, a, a good week of astronomy um, overall. And, um, um, you know, so, you know, summer's, cook, you know, heating up. Well, and that reminds uh, me, maybe real quick, maybe yeah. you can create a five minute little video. Uh, this the week in astronomy this past week and give an overview of what we did for the shows maybe maybe possible you know, maybe little clips from each show or something possible like it's pretty easy to do yeah so have to look that'd into be, doing that kind of cool yeah 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 a good commercial for what's coming up this is what we've done showing what we're getting ready to do yeah all right so i'm gonna all take right, off guys. see y'all bye-bye yeah. thanks, thanks everybody for watching thanks. 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 yep bye-bye Hey everybody, I just want to remind you that the Texas Star Party starts tonight, okay? So they will be broadcasting on their simulcasting, including simulcasting on Explore Scientific's Facebook page on Explore Scientific USA. You can find it if you go to explorescientific.com live and click on the, uh, you can just watch it there on that page if you want, because it does broadcast on that particular page or you can go straight to ex at Explore Scientific USA on Facebook. So uh, don't miss it. It starts tonight. Uh, we're giving away door prizes as, as well as uh, uh, there's gonna be great uh, speakers and all the rest of it. Uh, take care and just wanted to give that little shout out for them.